Good afternoon. It is an honor to welcome the family and friends of Bud Talbot to the Cleveland Museum of Natural History to remember and celebrate the life of a great man. The museum and our mission were obviously an integral part of Bud's life, and he was crucially important to the museum in so many ways, and very much beloved by everyone here. We continue to miss him every day. He was a strong and well-respected voice for the future of the community and our planet, and for the critical role of the museum in guiding us all toward a positive future. And he has left us with a great legacy. His voice, his passion, determination, and deep understanding of the issues facing the world today remain to form the steel of an invisible architecture of great strength upon we, which we will build for the future. On a personal note, I still expect to see him walk through my office door, a smile on his face, a twinkle in his eye, and a gracious greeting before getting down to a deep and heated discussion. <laughs> and you all know, Bud, it was more of a debate, and I was woefully underarmed. <laughs> but I loved it. I was immensely fortunate to have known Bud for a brief four years, and this institution is extraordinarily fortunate to have known and benefited from Bud and his wisdom, his guidance, his strong and pas passionate commitment over the past several decades and into the future. Welcome. Thank you, Evelyn. Hi, my name is Ava Talbot, and I am the youngest of Bud's grandchildren. On behalf of Bud's four children, 10 grandchildren, and six and counting great-grandchildren, thank you all for coming. And now, please join me in a moment of silence for those who are not here. Thank you. We deeply appreciate the presence of Bud's extended family and friends. His relationships with each of you are cause for celebration today. After the brief service and remarks, we invite you to join us next door for refreshments. Thank you to the museum, the musicians, and once again to, to all of you. This service is being recorded and will be available probably by tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ava, and thank you, Evelyn, so much to the museum for this extraordinary event. Um, by the way, the website, I think, is budsmemorialservice.com, and in the next day or two, hopefully, thanks to the museum staff, uh, this should be available for people who were not able to make it, if they'd like. Now, I'm also going to make sure to turn off my cell phone. It comforts Marjo. Where's Marjo and Paige? I just got to see my sisters here. Thank you, Marjo. I can't even see you. Where's Marjo? Can you thank? Thank you. It comforts Marjo, Paige, Strobe, and me enormously how much capacity that our dad had for caring about and loving people. He loved people unconditionally and boundlessly. And you can think of just his relationship with Josephine, the kids, our friends, our families, his beloved two brothers, their remarkable families that are here today, um, friends from Cleveland and beyond. His capacity for love was amazing. But so too was his love for nature. With inimitable pioneering spirit he knew the world isn't given by our parents, but rather, as another birder, Audubon, put it, the world is borrowed from our children. As a boy, Bud enjoyed many pets. He loved lizards, snakes, dogs. He contracted rabies twice, quite a story in itself, and he delved in outdoor mischief 
As my siblings and I were saying, the marvelous plain dealer Obet employed the word mischief beautifully to capture dad's spirit, his sense of adventure and fun. Marjo Page, do you remember the Shaker Lake, which we just drove by, early on years, when dad would peel off leeches from the side of the canoe and put them on his earlobe to freak you guys out? <laughs> do you remember that? I loved it. <laughs> While camping in the Canadian woods, he learned wilderness crafts from his father and grandfather, from the Ojibwe chief, Toab, I have a picture of him that we can look at later, and his best pal, George Green. After the war, as many of you know, dad kept these annual camping trips into the a tradition, uh, into his 80s, I believe, with the likes of John Holt, A. Clues, The Moors, Scott, Roger, so many others, expanding out from Pancake Lake to Minnesota, Wyoming, Alaska, Botswana, even thanks to this guy, Siberia, for a honeymoon chaperone, by the way. <clears throat> we all cultivate our garden of memories of Bud's delight as an outdoorsman and for me, I think of him with bird watching and the chagrin with Elena and Ava and Yvette, or tending his garden for Josephine, fishing for blue gills with the Houndstein clan, his beloved family on the property there, or with the Sullivans and Stacia in the Golden Islands of uh, Georgia. And many of you shared in the delight that Dad took in this corner of Ohio, the Quintrell Cabin, the Holden Arboretum, Stubbins Gulch, offered wonderful wilderness settings through the revolving seasons. Hunting provided another outlet for dad's passion for nature. And he took great pleasure in other people hunting and working the dogs much more than any shot he took. And as Strobe and I and B were talking about, he had a good shot when he did pull up that, shotgun, that Parker shotgun. Now, I believe, then ask Mark Virchbaugh, but I believe the statute of limitations is run. So I'm safe to tell you that a half a century ago, on occasion, not, not that often, but we'd go to the Curtain Club. When I was a little wee lad, and Strobe was, of course, older, we'd go to the Curtain Club, and in the back nine, Dad would pull out a 22 caliber pistol from the golf bag, and we'd shoot squirrels and skin them between the 10th and 11th hole. <laughs> Bumming around with Bud could be a blast. <laughs> now imagine a hotel lobby, 1965, Côte d'Azur of southern France. Bud and I are there draped in vests, binoculars, goofy shorts, and determined to go to some island Dad heard about with exotic bird species right off the coast. So Dad, ill-equipped with his French, went up to the maitre d' and said, uh, Nous sommes naturalistes. Well, when we arrived at the nudist colony next to the <laughs> National Park, <laughs> with the binoculars, I left an indelible impression on a young lad grateful such, for such an adventurous dad. <laughs> John Knights from TNC, Ohio, in one of many lovely letters, received since dad died, wrote, and I quote, all pioneers are risk takers, and Bud was no exception. He was one of the first influential leaders of the Cleveland community to warn about the threat of climate change and the need to take action, as Evelyn has mentioned, and we have all been the recipient of these discussions. But dad honed a really remarkable talent for combining business experience and acumen with friendly, persistent, patient passion. The elderly buds twinkle, that smile, grew out of decades of forging partnerships and consensus institution building trail blazing. Here's Bud from a 1992 Rotary Talk in Elyria, Ohio on the unintended consequences of environmental 
problems associated with human behavior. But we do not want to bequeath our children's children a world where the species survival crisis is man. We must seize the immediate opportunities for sound investment and for personal commitment and participation in this great issue of our time. Sounds familiar, right? It really does, you know? Because he, whether trudging through the Ontario woods with the Duluth pack on top of his backpack, with a canoe on top of that, on a rough portage, or driving with so many of these people I've already seen today to yet another Save the World meeting, Bud inspired us to join in. Some of us called it Budism. What would Bud do? Once scanning the sky for waterfowl, we spoke of Kierkegaard's haunting parable of the last flock of wild geese flying over the horizon into extinction, thereby diminishing humankind forever. Bud's attitude and life was testimony that we can hold nature sacred in a modern world that has rendered it largely profane. The four of us and our children have found deep solace and comfort just being outside under the sun and the moon as it has been for the ages. On this precious planet with the wind and the birds and the trees to connect us to dad. As black elk spoke, <clears throat> with tenderness have these living things come out of the ground. Look upon these faces of children without number and with children in their arms, that they may face the winds and walk the good road to the day of quiet. I hold dear a favorite memory of Bud. It was late August, cold dawn in Banff National Park with some of the folks here on one of these great camping trips. Pre-dawn, cold as anything, I opened up the zip because Bud was my tent mate. Took, I took the earplugs out. Opened up the tent zip because there was this commotion on the other side of the lake, a big lake on the other side, bam. So I opened it up and there I saw the strangest sight. It looked like a lumbering bear, right, with leopard spots chasing a wolverine. Nope, it was our Budley in PJs with polka dots chasing down the miscreant carnivore who had stolen our week's supply of butter and had it in his mouth. <laughs> and I remember Strobe and that, uh, that we ended up using bacon grease for butter that week. <laughs> in the end, as we begin our lives anew, with each day, Bud was not afraid to die. No moping, don't succumb to self-pity. Dad provided us courage and comfort, quoting the bard in one of his favorite quotes about nature's eternal promise when things get tough in this mortal coil. So if you're inclined, join me, please. From the second page of your beautiful um, brochure, and by the way, this is Rebecca Verschbau's wonderful painting Rebecca who's getting married to Cassidy, I'll put a plug in for that soon. So on the second page, let's read from the bard, as you like it, okay? If you want to. <clears throat> Sweet are the uses of adversity, which like the toad, ugly and venomous, wears yet a precious jewel in his head. And this, our life, exempt from public haunt, finds tongues and trees, books in the running brooks, sermons in the stones, and good in everything.
If any of you don't want to hear any more stories about the great bud and the great outdoors, leave now. <laughs> and in that connection, I want to join Kirk in thanking Evelyn and the museum for making this institution the venue for this service. And that's not just because Bud loved nature, which he surely did. It's also because he was very big on institutions. He felt that institutions were critical to the task of what he called our, our species, and he worried about our species from time to time, but it gave him hope that there were institutions like this one that allowed us to maintain some continuity in our values, in our knowledge, in our sense of what progress could mean from one generation to the next. And I noted that Kirk called Bud an institution builder. He was also, just as he was a nature lover, an institution lover, if they were, the, um, if they were ones like this one. And he felt very much the same way about traditions. He followed many of them. He founded a number. Some of them were simple and homely, like wearing bow ties. I think pretty much all the Talbot guys here today have bow ties on. And then there were the small traditions that meant so much to him and those who loved him. One of those was whipping up blueberry pancakes in the morning with some perch from the lower pond on his property when the Howensteins, with whom he shared Goose Hollow, one of the several wonderful families that helped him over the years with that lovely property, would gather in his kitchen. Now, as for the other traditions that Kirk has already given you a sense of, those in the great outdoors, they were not so simple, not so homely. They were arduous. They were primitive. They were violent. And they were an awful lot of fun to join Bud in. When Bud was armed and dangerous, which is to say on a hunting trip or with his bowie knife in the woods and with his ax, he wanted to have people with him who loved him enough to, as he put it happily, in the winter and the late fall, freeze their butts off, perhaps in a duck blind on a, sand, on a Sandusky marsh in the late fall, or in his deer stand on the property on a Sunday afternoon in winter, while he waited for hours with his crossbow. And what he often said on these occasions, with his teeth chattering, remember, this is fun we're having. <laughs> Bud came from a family that ritualized fun in all manner of sports, from round robin tennis and squash tournaments on weekends to donkey baseball and sack races at giant, elaborate family reunions held every five years going back to 1948. And even then, his was a very extended family, since his father was one of nine siblings, all of whom proved prolific. Bud's dad and namesake 
had a proud, profound influence on Bud's life. Little Bud followed in Big Bud's footsteps. As a youngster into the Ontario woods, as a teenager on to Hotchkiss, and then on to Yale, and of course into the Yale Bowl to play football, football and run sprints and hurdles, thereby wrecking his ankle and guaranteeing that he would spend some time at Judson seven decades later. He also followed his dad into uniform to fight in a world war and then into business in Dayton, where the Talbot clan had, for several generations already, predominated and proliferated. Now, truth to tell, being little Bud wasn't easy for our dad. He was a free spirit with a streak of the nonconformist in him, indeed, a streak of mischief. He had the guts, the restlessness, and the whimsy of an adventurer. He liked to strike out on his own. For an example, taken yet again from those wilderness trips, Bud was prone to changing plans and calling audibles. Those of us who made the portages with him in the Canadian bush north of Sault Ste. Marie can to this day easily remember hearing him with his voice echoing from under a hundred pound canoe on his shoulders say, let's just slip over that ridge and see if we can find a pretty little lake. Now slipping meant ignoring the map, leaving the trail, bushwhacking into the pines, and as often as not, getting lost. But sometimes, to his delight and to our relief, there actually was a pretty little lake over the ridge, with trout eager for our flies and a decent site to pitch camp. It was that venturesome bud who in 1952 pulled up stakes in Dayton, left all those relatives behind, and slipped 200 miles north, where he found a pretty big lake and his new home. Which is to say, of course, they found their new home, Bud and Joe. Now, to just about everyone in this room who, who knew them, that was one word, Bud and Joe. They met in his senior year at Yale during a fraternity party where she was the date of his best friend. And having oversampled the champagne punch, was throwing up in the ivy. Bud really liked to tell that story a lot more than Joe liked to hear it. <laughs> of all the traditions that have shaped our civilization, and of all the institutions that have nestled our individual humanity in the embrace of others. Marriage is the one that mattered most to Bud. It sustained his own distinctive characteristics, his enthusiasm, the optimism that Kirk evoked, and something else, a genius for appreciation, friendship, and love toward people different from him, starting with Joe herself. They were soulmates, complementary personalities, but by no means were they identical ones. And by no means whatsoever did they have identical enthusiasms. Joe's idea of nature at its best, after all, was Ikebana a genteel indoor sport, if ever there was one. Still, Josephine, 
she of the stern look, she of the tendency to correct the misuse of pronouns, she got a kick out of her nature boy, her brave hunter, her man. Or at least she did up to a point. One autumn day, it didn't exactly thrill Joe when Bud ar abruptly left the warmth of their kitchen, at the cocktail hour no less, to stalk a big buck that he'd spotted gazing on the edge of the upper pond. But it did thrill Joe when he actually dropped the prey with a single arrow from 30 yards. But then again, it did not thrill her when he dragged the carcass up from the pond and gutted and field dressed it right next to Joe's beloved flower garden. <laughs> but even then, there was a not quite suppressed spark of pride in her otherwise reproving look. In Bud's own eyes, Joe's high standards, refined tastes, and her discipline were a joy and a boon to him. They made him grateful for a dominant genetic trait in our family, the weakness of Talbot men for strong women. Her strength over their 61 years together buttressed his resilience in tough times, even and perhaps especially when she was gone. Ten years ago, a summer day that started like all others, with the two of them walking arm in arm down to the waterfalls at the base of their property, ended that night with Joe in a coma. Bud left her side long enough to have a lousy dinner in the dreary, almost empty cafeteria in the basement of University Hospital. He was depressed to the point of questioning whether he wanted to live, which was about as unbud-like a sentiment as anybody can imagine. There was nothing sweet in that adversity. Yet there was much that was courageous, wise, noble, and generous in the uses that he made of it, starting that very night. In his hours of deepest despair, we could almost see him fighting his way back, playing through the injury, he called it. He was determined, he said, not to give up, if only to be an example to his children so that they might be better able to cope with grief when it came to them in their lives. He willed himself not only to go on living, but to throw himself back into life. Literally before the sun rose on his first day as a widower, Bud decided out of the blue to visit India, somewhere he had long wanted to go, and somewhere where Josephine had long not wanted to go. <laughs> Bud came home from that trip, not just overflowing with excitement about the tiger preserves and the aviaries that he had visited in Rajasthan, but also subscribing to parts of Hinduism that made sense to him, which was pretty much his attitude towards Episcopalianism, or for that matter, Druidism, which is what we and the family called his nature worship. As Kirk has said, going back to his childhood, Bud loved pretty much all God's creatures, large and sm small, venomous and not, but most particularly he loved dogs, and even more particularly, Labrador retrievers, not least because they, unlike many of his hunting companions, were as, enthousi as enthusiastic as he was and didn't complain. And of course, he loved all species of birds, 
notably including those that he occasionally blasted out of the sky. But his favorite birds, he often said, were swans. Why? Because they're monogamous. Back at the time of Bud and Joe's wedding in 1943, an ancient uncle offered the shortest and best of toasts for that occasion. Court through life. The traditionalist in Bud made those three words a dictum not just for his own marriage, but for his children's and grandchildren's as well. And you can bet that that toast will be repeated when the time comes for his great-grandchildren, all six of whom are here today. Well, I think Rosalie may have just departed, and more to come. Which takes us to this past winter and the sweet uses Bud made of the ultimate adversity. Most of his brood, all four generations of us, gathered by tradition at Mark and Marjo's home in Washington over the holidays. That gave us a chance for an impromptu celebration of the latest engagement in the family, Mark and Marjo's daughter, Rebecca, the artist, and her Cassidy. And it gave Bud a chance to offer the toast one more time. 71 years after he had first heard it and etched it into his heart. Christmas Day was his last healthy one. His departure was in its own way very Bud-like. No screwing around, as he might have put it. No bitching and moaning. He had somewhere to go, and that was that, although he wasn't exactly sure where he was going, which made him all the more determined to call some audibles and make some detours along the way, off the path, maybe not even on the map. For the first time in his nearly 95 years on this planet that he cared so much for, Bud was not living in the moment. He was not in the here and now. Instead, he was slipping away, slipping over the hill behind him, hoping there would be a pretty little lake on the other side, or better yet, a pair of ponds. He was reliving good times, cooking pancakes for the Howensteins in the kitchen at sunrise, fishing on the lower pond or deer stalking on the upper one before sundown or freezing his butt off in a duck blind. Wherever he was, it was fun he was having. And we know that because one night near the end, Bud was restless. Mark went into his room and asked if there was anything he could do to make Bud more comfortable. The answer came with some agitation. I can't find my gun. Mark being Mark retorted, do you want to shoot me or shoot yourself? <laughs> no, Bud replied, I'm going hunting. Well, that I think was his best exit line, but it was not his most fervent one. In those days, he told us with every passing day, with a little more conviction, that he was feeling better and therefore he wanted to go home. Actually, he told us that over and over again with more emphasis every time. Dads sometimes do that when they're trying to get their kids to understand. Well, we understood. Bud wanted to go home. He wanted to go home to everything and everyone he loved. But most of all, he wanted to go home to Joe.
Some people come into our lives and quickly go. Some stay for a while, leave footprints on our hearts, and we are never the same. By Flavia. Uncle Bud, or Budley, was more than an uncle to many of us. For his brother Jim's family, which includes Jay, Thomas, and myself, he played a very important paternal role in our family. He cared for our family during the years that my dad was very sick, and he was always supportive of mom. And along with Uncle Doug, his youngest brother, came to visit during some very critical times. I remember them both coming to visit and stay with us for several days in about 1974 when dad had a very serious surgery. And, you know, I'm sure it was a big deal for my dad having both his brothers there, not only seeing the love and support, but also their humor. Um, you know, Bud's love and support of our extended family over the years has just been evident in so many ways. He's loved all of us nieces and nephews and extended families, inviting us to Goose Hollow for various occasions, entertaining our families for trips, hunting, fishing, bird watching, playing in the pond, skiing, cross-country skiing, trips to Lake Erie. And, you know, like our cousin Rich said, you can't pick up a pair of binoculars and go bird watching without thinking about Uncle Bud. We love building memories of adventures together and looking over the next horizon, as Strobe alluded to. He was part of all of our weddings, as well as Thomas and Cindy's daughter's weddings. We loved introducing our spouses, spouses-to-be to him, not only looking for his approval, but also because we wanted them to get to know him and our special Uncle Bud. He's taken a personal interest in our lives personally and professionally. He's always asked challenging questions. We know he always cared about us. As Rich, one of his nephews said, conversations about Uncle Bud were never about himself. Rather, they were about us, our careers, our future, our finances, are you doing okay financially? He became the paternal figure in our life, something we really appreciated, and he really loved us. Bud gave Jay great advice at one point and challenged Jay to go on to grad school, when, and then he pursued his MBA. Then later, when he lost his job due to some employer downsizing, Bud and Jay spent time together discussing professional opportunities, and Bud challenged Jay to go into business for himself, which Jay countered and said, no, I'm, I'm not a salesman. Well, you can imagine who won that argument. So <laughs> Jay thanks him to this day as Jay's doing very well in his own business. Thomas also saw Bud very much as a father figure, as Bud really encouraged him a lot in his financial career and supporting him and giving him guidance, but also in his hobbies of fishing and hunting. Thomas has great stories of hunting and fishing together. I think that's probably where Thomas probably learned to tie his own flies and how to trout fish, bass fishing, all that. But Thomas has great pictures and stories of even last fall when they went hunting together and just all the goose they hunted on. It's phenomenal just a few months ago. You could tell Bud loved getting to know the grandnieces and nephews, asking about interests in sports, music, academics, always challenging him to be their best, pursue passions and dreams, but always having fun with them too. I can remember him being in the kitchen and Andrew telling Uncle Bud, there's squirrels out there. They're going after the bird feeders, and Bud looking up with that twinkle in his eye. Andrew, go get my pink BB gun and go shoot those squirrels. And Andrew going, really? Really? <laughs> Our families really also cherish the Talbot reunions. Always proud to identify ourselves as part of the Bud Talbot family. We've laughed, played crazy games together, performed silly skits. Of course, never complete without Rich, Mark, David showing the true Talbot humor. But how can we carry out another Bud Talbot skit without our fearless Bud there? So whether it was, you know, a meal around the table together with a pile of blueberry pancakes, 
his, a plate of ratatouille that he just whipped up for us, some fresh fish just caught in the pond that he grilled for us, a walk in the woods with him, a trip into Chagrin Falls, sitting on the deer stand with him. We always saw that twinkle in his eye. We heard his thoughtful questions and advice and felt the love. All of us in the extended Talbot family can truly say, Bud, we're glad you stayed on this earth a good long time. You left footprints in our hearts and we will never be the same. I'm Jim Gould, Paige's husband, and one of two good-for-nothing son-in-laws. <laughs> now, the good-for-nothing is actually a positive thing. It takes a long time to achieve. It's almost like a journey you take to become an Eagle Scout. I've known Bud for more than 40 years. The first four as that guy. The next 15 as the son-in-law and the rest, you guessed it, the good-for-nothing son-in-law. <laughs> Aside from Paige, my brother John, my mom and dad, Bud was the most influential person in my life. He was also my teacher mentor, friend, business role model, and fan. Bud taught me many things with varying degrees of success. 
for example. He had no idea how much patience it would take to make me make peace with a canoe. I know, you've heard from Strobe and Kirk. These were quite adventures. We ventured to Alaska, one of the first trips I ever took, and it was way the hell out in no man's land. And on the first night, first day, we struck camp beside a lake. Bud says to the group, I'm going to teach Jim to make peace with a canoe. That meant having me walk about a half a mile with a 15-foot aluminum canoe through the densest brush in North America. <laughs> Remember, I was a new son-in-law. I was still on probation. <laughs> a long way from Eagle Scout. So I didn't want to disappoint my new father-in-law. That day, despite what Bud may have told some of you or you've heard, I tried, but I did not make peace with a canoe. And at the risk of possibly not remaining a son-in-law, I told him what he could do with his damn canoe. <laughs> <clears throat> the next day, he invited me, invited me to go fishing with him, and we took off in a rubber raft. When we were out in the middle of this lake, remember, we're in Alaska, Bud turns to me and says, Jim, it's probably not a good idea for us to be in the middle of this lake in a rubber raft, we could die of hypothermia within three minutes. Now, I'm really regretting what I told him to do with his canoe. <laughs> From that point on, I was the perfect son-in-law <laughs> until we reached shore. Bud was a mentor in many ways to me especially in business. Bud had the skill to plan for the long term even while his business associates were looking at today and tomorrow. For sure, Bud's mentoring helped me become a, a better, in his words, damn banker. I became Bud's secret weapon for a while when he transitioned from the public finance world um, to that of a private banking or private business um, world. At the time, I was um, a Philadelphia banker dealing in the same type of companies uh, in which Bud was the CEO and owned. While he was working with his Cleveland bankers during the day, he was calling me for advice on loan agreements, loan terms, pricing, and how do I deal with my bankers for this upcoming meeting. He made an amazing transition from working in the public finance world where financial information is abundant and management teams worry about next quarter's performance or shareholders' value to working in the private business world where financial information is scarce, intuition critical, and you have to look at the short term as much as you look at the long-term survival. He did remarkable things with his company, both for the short term and long term. He eventually sold the company for more money than I could have imagined. I regret that he really never 
understood just how successful he was in business. Early on, Bud gave his two son-in-laws a crash course on how to buy a car. One day he says to Mark and me, guys, we're gonna go buy a car. We said, sure, no problem. Boy, did we get the business lesson of our lives. By the time Bud got done working over this young salesman <laughs> and his manager, Mark and I were trying to become invisible. <laughs> but as always, Bud did his homework. He knew what he was going to pay for that car. So he gets out his checkbook, makes an offer, writes a check out for the deposit, puts it on the table. This young salesman says, Mr. Talbot, uh, uh, that offer's just too low. Bud says, come on, guys, we're, we're leaving. Oh, now, now Mark and I are just petrified. We say, oh, my God, what have we gotten ourselves into on this? As we stood up to leave, almost instantly, Bud's offer became an acceptable deal. You know, watching Bud in action, learning from it, has served me well in my banking career. Very early on, there were clear signs Bud and I were going to become dear friends. In 1974, Joe and Bud hosted a fantastic rehearsal dinner for me and Paige at their home. And towards the end of the night, Bud was instructed by you know who to take Jim down to the pond and have a talk. And I'm thinking, oh no. Is he gonna try and drown me? <laughs> Is he going to give me a stern lecture? Well, neither thing happened. We just had a good old guy talk. We talked about fishing, hunting, sports, except for the time he said about breaking both my arms and legs if I didn't take good care of his daughter. <laughs> to me, Bud was an exceptional father-in-law, friend, teacher, mentor, and business role model. When I think of him, the one thing that shines through and pulls it all together is the unquestioned integrity embedded in the way he lived his life. The world would be a better place if more people followed his example. I'm Becca. Before I start, I just want to say one more time how much our family appreciates the museum's generosity and all the consideration that you guys have shown us. I also want to thank Mark and Shelby for this really awesome slideshow. I know that there are millions of really, really great pictures of Bud because space so great. Um, like that. <laughs> but we just really appreciate the slideshow. It's really beautiful and perfect. I am a grandchild of Bud, and I have nine cousins, and we each, of course, had our own special relationship with him and experienced our grandfather differently. But what I hope to talk about today is that I think there are a lot of common truths for all of us about the role that Budley played in our lives. Bud was much more than a grandfather. I remember him as a superhero. Everything was an adventure with him. He gutted his own fish, and he didn't cry much when he dropped a burning log on his foot. He called himself Brown Bear and would make out with his wife in front of us. 
At the age of 90, after a foot surgery and many falls, we all pressured Bud to buy a cane. When he finally conceded, he chose one with camouflage print and then used it to poke small children. <laughs> I hope everybody got to see that. So for one, he inspired us to be our own people. For another, he was responsible for the weirdly close relationships that we all have with our extended family as a result of squishing together for several weeks a year into boats, planes, and tents. Because Bud put family above everything else, I grew up with my cousins under his wise and mischievous eyes. Playing pranks on Devin, who retaliate by inter intercepting my phone calls with boys, dressing Adam up as a girl, peeing in the woods for the first time in front of Alex and getting laughed at, helping teach my younger cousins to swim, wincing as Katie fell from her bike again, and delighting as Adrian cut into an elephant dung cake that we'd prepared for him in Africa. Now there is an unshakable bond between us. Like our parents' generation, we're world travelers and outdoors men because, and women, because Bud took us camping before we learned to multiply and brought us all over the world. We celebrated a birthday in Ecuador, created a tourist attraction for hikers by sunbathing in Spain, and scaled trees in Africa. We learned our strength when Bud yelled at us to paddle harder to the center of the lake in a storm just to save a hat. We learned our endurance when he kept us awake with his endless snoring. We learned to love nature by tracking herons with him in his backyard and listening to a tape of bird calls at deafening volume in his station wagon. It was like he was injecting naturalism into our bloodstreams, and it took. Bud had extremely high expectations of himself and therefore for all of his grandchildren. When we were little, he would force us to flip off the diving board before we knew how to swim. When we were bigger, he expected every single one of us to go to Yale. None of us did. <laughs> but that was the thing. Though at certain times, certain values like wealth, higher education, tradition were of the utmost importance to him, Bud let himself be complex when it came to his grandchildren. He preached against unmarried couples staying in the same room, but would invite our boyfriends on family trips. An avid meat eater and hunter, Bud went kicking and screaming to a place called Greens during his first visit to San Francisco. For years after, he would call me on a whim and ask, when are we going back to that vegetarian restaurant? <laughs> Despite his values, Bud accepted that we aren't all traditional people. Some of us have chosen careers that may never be lucrative. Some of us will never go to grad school. We are actors and artists. We own risky businesses. We are feminists, and some of us live in San Francisco. <laughs> But no matter where we were in the country, Bud always put us on the top of his priority list. Visiting us across the country, coming to see our hearings, or churches, or volleyball games, or classes, even if he sometimes fell asleep during them. And this winter, he flew to DC at the age of 93 so that he could read the night before Christmas to his great-grandchildren. And we know that Teddy, at four, got it. As Bud was leaving this world, every one of us came from wherever we were to be with him. People sang and held his hand and told him stories. We each had our own way of being there, but what we shared was that it was our only priority. Even, and, and when he was gone, all of us held each other. I arrived at the house just at this moment and could already feel the catharsis of being with my family. And to be honest, the next days were joyful. We were all under one roof, loving each other and loving him, pouring over memories and snuggling. It was like the culmination of his life's work. There is only really one way that we can honor Bud, and that is to continue this work. We need to find the time to gather often, to squish our children together onto planes, boats, and in tents, to continue having adventures together and to live our lives to the fullest, letting Bud live on through our memories, 
our love for him and our love for each other.